So I think I started recording. Yes. Okay, so as usual, let me start with a review of our last lecture, our lecture on Friday. Um, so I, on Friday, I tried to convince you that um, in reality we have a distributed pressure force around our airfoil, but this is equivalent to a single force vector applied at a special point which we call the center of pressure. And then we uh, compose this vector into two components, and we call them lift and drag forces. Mm -hmm. And then we can also move these forces to any fixed point from the center of pressure. At this, uh, in this case, I took the leading edge as the fixed point, but it can be any other point. Uh, and then once we do that, we introduce a moment term. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the, all these three cases are equivalent. So it's important to know that we don't really lose any accuracy here. Uh, okay, so in the beginning of the course I told you that we simplify the equations and we use some approximate equations to have simple, um, easy to work with uh, equations, but this is not one of them. Okay, so whatever motion you get if you consider this distributed force is exactly the same to the motion you would get with this force representation. We don't really lose any accuracy, okay? So this is not an approximation. This is an exact representation of uh, the real situation. Okay, and then <coughs> I started talking about the aerodynamic coefficients. Uh, so today I will explain why we use this representation instead of having the force applied at the actual center of pressure. We assume it's applied at a fixed point and then we calculate the moment to do that conversion. So I will explain that a little bit more today. Okay, and then I explained what aerodynamic coefficients are. So basically, if you remember, all difficulties in calculating the forces are dumped into aerodynamic coefficients. Uh, so the goal is to find the forces and moments acting on an aircraft. And while doing that, we um, use equations. For example, this is the equation to give the lift force. And the lift force depends on a lot of factors. Okay? Some of these um, factors are predictable, such as the air density. The, the, uh, the way air density affects forces is a linear, linear relation. There's a linear relation. So that's an easy one. So we can take it outside this. A complex function, but anything else that is difficult to predict and difficult to model, they are left within these uh, within an unknown function, and we call that unknown function the aerodynamic coefficient. Um, <coughs> so, if you define the lift coefficient, for example, uh, then the lift force can be calculated using this relation. So, these are the things uh, that we can uh, model. Um, and then everything else that cannot be modeled with simple relations are uh, left within that aerodynamic coefficient. Okay? So you can write all the three forces on three different axes using these relations. And here we define the lift coefficient, drag coefficient, and side force coefficient. So that's where we stopped on Friday. Okay, so let's let me come to today's topic. Uh, <coughs> so for the forces, we use these three relations, and remember the uh, the benefit of these relations that once you define choose these equations, then these coefficients, aerodynamic coefficients, are dimensionless. So you have a force is equal to pressure times area, which is force. So this. The, these two terms multiplied together gives a force. So the, then this should be non-dimensional. Okay? But for the moment terms, uh, this time these are the three moments, pitching, rolling, and yawing moments. And you know, moment is force multiplied by distance. So for the moment equations to have non-dimensional coefficients, we need additional distance terms here. Uh, for the pitching motion, we use the mean aerodynamic chord, which is what I defined before. And for the rolling and yawing motions, the wingspan is used. 
So these distance terms are introduced such that uh, these coefficients are non-dimensional as well. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, if you want to find the forces and moments on an aircraft, then you need to... Th these are the equations that you use. For example, for the moment uh, calculation, we use these equations. So you need to calculate the dynamic pressure. You need to know the wing span, uh, I'm sorry, wing surface area and these distances. And then you need to know the, the aerodynamic coefficients. Okay, so this is really the difficult part because the other terms are easy to calculate. We don't really have any problems with that. But if you want to find the forces accurately, then you need to know the accurate values for these coefficients. And let's see. Okay, so the benefit of using non-dimensional aerodynamic coefficients for this purpose is that <coughs> you can find values of these coefficients by doing experiments on much smaller scale models. Okay, uh, so let me go back to my previous example here. So suppose that I want to know the lift force for this aircraft, and I need to know their dynamic coefficient value, right? And to do that, uh, what we do is we measure these forces. And once you measure the forces, you can find the, the coefficient value, right? So in other words, so I actually measure the lift force, and then I divide it by these terms, and I get the aerodynamic coefficient. But <laughs> this is a very huge aircraft. How can I possibly measure the forces on that? So uh, it's a huge aircraft. It is almost 80 meters from wingtip to wingtip. So it's a really huge aircraft. Uh, so what we do is we build a much smaller version of the airplane, the same design, but it's much smaller. It's small enough to be fit in, in a wind tunnel, and then measure the forces in a wind tunnel using some devices, some uh, force measuring devices. Uh, <coughs> okay, so this is an explanation of that. I can make this slightly bigger actually. So in this example, we have uh, the Concorde aircraft. So I want to calculate the force on the Concorde. Uh, I design and manufacture a, a manufacture a much smaller version of it. So this is the same aircraft, but much smaller. And then I put this in a wind tunnel uh, and measure the forces. So this is what I measure. I direct measure uh, this for any flight condition. Uh, the flat condition I generate in the wind tunnel. And then I divide it by these numbers. Uh, so the K is the scaling factor, by the way. So the real aircraft has a wingspan of B meters. And the, the small model has a wingspan of K times B. And K is the number less than 1. Okay, so this is the scaling factor. And uh, naturally, the wing sur surface area will be k squared times the, the wing surface area of the original airplane. And this calculation will give me a lift coefficient, okay? So I will have, now I have a lift coefficient. So using this lift coefficient, I can go back to my equation and then predict the forces for the real airplane. And while doing that, I take this lift coefficient, which I calculated from my wind tunnel measurements, and then I come back to um, the same equation, but the difference is this time I use the dynamic pressure and the wing surface area of the real airplane. So this is uh, the same equation, but I used the values for the wind tunnel testing. So this is dynamic pressure of the wind tunnel test and the wing surface area of the wind tunnel model. From here, I got a list coefficient, and then I take the same list coefficient and put it into the same equation with the difference that instead of the wind tunnel testing values here, I use the values of the real aircraft. And after I do that, I get a lift value, and this time this lift value is the lift value for the real aircraft. 
Okay, does this make sense? And this is only possible because these air drag coefficients are non-dimensional. So anything related to uh, the dimensions of our airplane are left outside these uh, values. Okay? Um, Okay, so if you want to find the forces for a different case, let me go back to the previous aircraft. So this appears to be a climbing flight, okay? So if you want uh, where the angle of attack should be positive. Uh, but if you want to calculate the forces for a different flight condition, that means for a different speed or for a different uh, angle of attack, uh, what I do the same thing again. I go back to the wind tunnel and I change the, uh, the flight condition for that and I take a new measurement and then I, for the new measurement I cal calculate the corresponding aerodynamic coefficient and then uh, using that aerodynamic coefficient I can uh, find the forces for the real aircraft or that flight condition. Okay? Uh, Okay, now I would like to talk a little bit about how these forces are measured in the wind tunnel. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to use an airfoil, but the same thing is valid for uh, a full aircraft as well. Okay, so we have a wind tunnel test section. So this is the side view. Okay, we are sitting next to the wind tunnel. This is what we see. And the air is coming this way. So we can set this, okay, so we have the control of the wind tunnel by changing the, the tunnel speed. We can set the free stream flow velocity, this is our V infinity. And now we put a model in, a, in the test section. Okay, so uh, we have this... Um, airfoil in the wind tunnel. Again, this could be a real, uh, I mean, a full aircraft as well, not just a, a wing section. Uh, but for uh, drawing purpose, this is easier to represent, so that's why I'm using a, an airfoil here. So I turn the tunnel on, and some aerodynamic forces are developed over this uh, model. Okay, so let's say this is the force uh, vector which is applied at the center of pressure. Uh, so I can divide this into lift and drag components. So this is my drag force. This is my lift force. Um, okay, so obviously this wing section cannot just sit there uh, in the middle of the um, test section, right? So I need to fix it. So otherwise, if I leave it there, it, I, don't, I can't uh, guarantee what will happen. It will either uh, go up and hit the ceiling, or it will fall down and hit the floor, or it will just tumble, and I, I need to basically fix this. So what I do is I... Um, some mechanical parts I use to fix it, attach it, uh, uh, securely in the test section. So let me, for example, suppose that I fix it using this rod here. Okay, so this is a, a, a solid rod plate put there to securely uh, hold the, the airfoil within the test section. Uh, so no matter how the uh, the the flow is changing here. The, the wing doesn't move, okay? So it's fixed uh, through this attachment part here. Şimdi şeyde e, beslenen bir dersle ilk anlatmaya başladığımda bu yaptığım şeyler öğrencilerin çok ilgisini çekiyordu. Aynı şekilde anlatıyordum. Aynı tip bilgisayarla. 
Herkes hayret gidiyordu vay nasıl yapıyorsun falan diye. Tabi teknoloji gelişiyor. Şimdi artık iPad'ler, bilmem, cep telefonları falan herkes aşina olduğu için bu tip şeylere o kadar artık eskisi kadar iyi çekmiyor. Ee, hatta hatırlıyorum şöyle bir, bir, bir şey yapmıştım ve bütün sınıf alkışlamıştı. Çok hoşlarına gitmişti. <gülüyor> Uh, so anyway, so this is our wind uh, tunnel model, and it doesn't move. So remember the Newton laws of motion again. It doesn't move means that there should be no net force on it, right? If there was a net force, then there would be an acceleration, and acceleration starts motion. And since it doesn't move, then there should be no forces. The net forces on our model should be zero. Okay, so that means at this uh, attachment point, there will be some contact uh, forces, right? So let me call this force X. Let me call this Fy. And then there will be a moment. And then let me call this Mr. So these are the forces at the, uh, the point where it is attached to the uh, wind tunnel. Okay, so let me just type this. Uh, since the model doesn't move, and it should be zero. So if you consider the forces in the x direction, that means if you take this as the positive direction, uh, drag is in the positive direction and then fx is in the negative direction and it should be equal to zero. So that means fx should be equal to the drag force. Uh, you do the same for the uh, vertical forces. So it's fx, fy. And lift and then there's minus fy is equal to zero. So that means fy should be equal to the lift force. And if you look at the moment calculations, let's take this as the positive direction, the total moment, uh, I have this MR in the positive direction and then the, the moment due to this R vector is in the negative direction. Uh, let me write it as R times uh, the moment arm. Let me call that L, R times L should be equal to zero. And that means the reaction moment should be equal to R times the moment R L. Okay, so at the point where the model is uh, fixed, let me say. We place sensors that can measure forces and moments um, in other words, we In the above example, fx, fi, and mr are directly measured, which gives um, the drag force, lift force, and moment with respect to leading edge. Okay? Uh, this is what you will do, by the way. Uh, you will have two wind tunnel experiments throughout this course, and in one of those experiments, you, you will be uh, doing exactly this uh, scenario here. You will put a, a wing section in a wind tunnel, you will turn the tunnel on, and then you will be measuring these forces. Okay? including the, the pitching moment. You will measure all these things, lift, drag, and the pitching moment. Um,
Okay. So as you see, in a wind tunnel, we can measure lift and drag forces and the pitching moment with respect to a fixed point directly from the moment measurement we can go back to uh, the center of pressure And so since uh, the lift and drag forces are measured, we can find R as follows. And then uh, using this relation, I can find so I can obtain the central pressure, but what I measure first is the moment with respect to a fixed point. Okay? And if I want, I can go back to the central pressure, but I cannot measure the central pressure directly in such a mechanism. Uh, so why I explained to you all that? Uh, to explain to you why we use this representation here. So because these are the things that we can directly measure in a wind tunnel experiment. <coughs> and we know that this, um, once we know all these quantities, uh, we know the, the effect of the actual force distribution on the airfoil. Okay? So this is the, the reason why we uh, take the central pressure and carry the forces to a known fixed location. That's because that's what we really measure. And also we need the, the moment anyways. So once we know these forces, if you want to uh, simulate the aircraft, if you want to predict its motion, then you need to use the equation of motion. And in the equation of motion, uh we use uh, these forces to simulate the aircraft, for example. This is just one reason why we need these forces. You may be uh, using these forces for other purposes as well. Aircraft, for example, for which we use the equations of motion. And these equations of motion are, again, the Newton's um, laws of motion. F is equal to mass times acceleration, and the, the, or I should say moment, is equal to the moment of inertia times, let me say alpha, and this is angular acceleration. So even if uh, we measure the center of pressure directly, we need to convert it to moments for uh, simulation purposes. Therefore, measuring the moment directly simplifies our job.
Okay? Uh, so hopefully now you appreciate why we use this other representation because that's what we need and that's what we measure. So for both of these reasons it makes more sense to use this representation. Okay? Good. Now Okay, uh, let me keep typing some more stuff here. So for every possible aircraft configuration and flight condition, we need to know the corresponding uh, values values of the uh, aerodynamic coefficients this requires a huge number of aerodynamic coefficient values to be known Okay, so let's say the lift coefficient depends on certain factors. For example, uh, first it depends on the design of the aircraft. It depends on fixed design parameters. It depends on the flight condition. And also it depends on uh, variable aircraft configurations such as uh, the elevated deflection angle, rudder deflection angle, things like that, that can be changed during the flight. Let me call all of them variable Böyle bir imkanı olunca da insan bazen abartıyor sürekli bu kullanıyor ama. Um, variable configuration parameters. And let me give you some examples of this. The, the fixed design parameters for example are uh, these are wing expect ratio. Okay, so the aspect ratio, paper ratio, yeah, you can put a lot of different things there. Uh, for flat condition, we can say um, angle of attack. Angle of side slip, and there it is of these um, parameters, and there's examples of variable configuration parameters. 
the control surface deflection uh, you can also put things like flaps flats and spoilers Uh, by the way, I I defined the angle of attack, but I didn't say anything about uh, side slip angle before. So let me use this uh, picture to explain that. So in two dimensions, I define the angle of attack, remember, uh, I defined it as the angle between the free stream velocity vectors and the chord line, right? So that was the angle of attack, so which is shown here, so this is our angle of attack. And in, you, when you go to uh, three dimensions, uh, you can have um, another component of the velocity vectors, in other words, the, the free stream velocity vector doesn't have to be in the vertical plane. So there may be a lateral component of the velocity vector. And to represent that uh, uh, component, the, the ang angle of side slip is defined. So in three dimensions, uh, this vector is the, the velocity vector of the aircraft. or I use it, the free stream velocity vector, so th let me put the arrow here, so this is RV infinity, and the angle the infinity makes with the, the chord line is called angle of attack, if you look at it from the side uh, view, but and if you look at it from the top view, the angle between the center axis and the velocity vector is called ang the beta, right, so this is the side slip angle. Okay, so uh, so I need to know the value of this coefficient for every possible combination of all these all these things here. For example, when the aircraft is flying at three degrees angle of attack and five degrees side slip, and the elevator is deflected to three degrees while the rudder is set at zero degrees, so that, there's a value for that particular case. And for another combination, there needs to be another value. If you consider all possible combinations of all these things, you're talking about a huge number of aerodynamic coefficient values. And for a realistic aircraft simulation, this number can easily go up to tens of millions. Okay? Uh, so, so, I think that's explained here a little bit. If you consider all possible combinations of these variables, number of required coefficient values can easily reach tens of millions for a realistic simulation. Uh, so obviously it's not really practical to find each one of these coefficient values in a wind tunnel just because of the, the number of uh, coefficients you need. So what we do is 
um, you do wind tunnel testing for a limited number of cases, for example, for 100 or several hundred cases, you can only make testing for those numbers. And you fill in the, the other values by using some other methods. So there are some quick estimation methods, uh, some uh, quick uh, empirical uh, tools are available, so they can predict, uh, fill in the gaps between the, these. Uh, so for example, you measure the, uh, the elevated deflection at 0 degrees and 10 degrees and minus 10 degrees, okay? So in between, you fill in using some other quick tools to predict these forces. And somehow you obtain this huge database, and that's called the aerodynamic database of an aircraft. Uh, so that's the most critical part in finding these forces. So once you have, you need that database if you want to uh, accurately study the dynamics or uh, the performance of an aircraft. Okay. Okay, now I think we can start talking about this viscosity thing. Uh, so if you remember this, when I, um, when I started explaining the aerodynamic coefficients, I had this viscosity and compressibility effect. Uh, so now I will be talking about this viscosity effect. Okay, so I told you that instead of to predict the forces of a real large aircraft, we make a small scale version of it and put it in a, a wind tunnel and measure the forces on the small version and use the coefficients to predict the forces of the real aircraft. Uh, so this really works because we have these non-dimensional coefficients, but still there are certain things that we need to be careful about. Uh, so this is related to the characteristics of the flow when uh, 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 whenever a fluid is flowing around an object, it has certain characteristics, right? So it can be it can flow in an orderly fashion. You know the the fluid streamlines are parallel and they it flows smoothly, or it can flow in a uh, in a random fashion. So the, the streamlines get mixed up, the, fl the flow gets, you know, vortices and it gets all these turbulences. And we need to be careful about the type of the flow. So just because you have a small scale version of the same aircraft doesn't mean that to have the same flow characteristics. Uh, so you, everything is the same. For example, let's take a look at these boats. So this is a real boat which has a length of 100 meters and I have a much smaller version of it, 10 centimeters. Uh, so everything is the same, okay? It's just that it's a much smaller version. So this doesn't mean that the flow, uh, or we can use an aircraft here as well. Uh, let me use this example. So the flow, the characteristics of the flow of the real aircraft can be different than the characteristics of the flow around this small aircraft. And we need to make sure that we have the same characteristics. Otherwise, the coefficients, the non-dimensional coefficients we obtain in the wind tunnel does not give us correct values for the real aircraft. So at this point, I think we need to start talking about flow characteristics. And uh, before the break, let me end this hour with a video. Again, this is a very simple experiment that you can try at home. Uh, so this is very, uh, very, sim very simple way to see uh, different characteristics of flow. So let me just turn this on.
So obviously it's much easier to see this on water because we can directly see it. But the same thing happens with airflow as well. Sometimes the air flows in a very orderly fashion. Uh, the streamlines are all parallel. And sometimes we get turbulent flow. That means the streamlines get mixed up and we have this random and chaotic uh, flow of air. And uh, that's something we need to be careful about because the, the difference between a small model in a wind tunnel and the real airplane may be uh, different. And let's do a break now. I will be talking about that after the break. <laughs> 